This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. All right, the first thing you need to have for emergency preparedness is not water storage. It's not a garden. It's not even ammunition. It's a right relationship with Yehovah. In a very practical and serious discussion about how to prepare, Bear Independent shares the do's and don'ts of what you need for this life, and more importantly, how to prepare for eternity. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalomi, homies, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. <laughs> Tonight we are continuing our very informative series with Bear Independent called Grin and Bear It. You're going to want to have two things on hand for this, the remote control and your phone. Why? Because we're going to have a lot of tips of what to do and where to get things in case of an emergency. So you're gonna to wanna to pause the teaching, take a photo, a screenshot, whatever, with your phone, with your computer, to remember what you saw and go get this stuff after Shabbat. So get ready. Also, tonight we are now into the second Shabbat of the 12th month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar, which we are going to take a look at with my co-host, Angie Clark. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, how are you? Good, thank you for oh, having me. <laughs> we're so cordial with each other. Shabbat Shalom, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was gonna give you a fist bump. Oh, well, like, eh, I can do that well. too. <laughs> <laughs> now this month, uh, we, uh, so Purim uh, is, is upon us here. So uh, Purim is this weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the story of Esther uh, that a lot of people know. So Esther, uh, and also it's the resurrection of Lazarus. Right. Better known as uh, Eleazar which uh, just before the cameras came on, we kind of like, oh yeah, I forgot his name was Eleazar. Yeah. So we find that in uh, the Chronological Gospels, which by the way, you can get a free one of these that Angie's gonna tell you about in a second. But first, I'm gonna go to, uh, in the second edition here, page 139. And this is event 149, the raising of Eleazar in Bethany. Okay. And this happened, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but this happened on Purim, um, and that's when uh, Lazarus, Lazarus or Eleazar was raised. Mm -hmm. And of course, Yeshua said, come out. And there's all kinds of correlation. If you really look at the story and you look at Purim, there's correlations there. Oh I mean, my gosh, Yeshua yes. did this for a reason. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything he do does is intentional. Yep. Everything. Now, now there's something that they do in uh, that's intentional, by the way, in Jerusalem too. Uh, the next, So there's Purim on... The, the Shabbat and mm -hmm. then this this year. And then there's something called, Sh or is it? Uh, Shushan Purim. Shushan Purim. Oh, so, yes, yeah, so Purim is on the Sunday this week. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, so, so tonight at, at uh, after Shabbat right. on Saturday starts Purim. But then there's this other thing called Shushan Purim. And you might have heard of this and thought, well, I've heard of that in some Jewish circles. Of what is that? So we have an explanation here on the bottom of the calendar. And it says, might have to take my glasses off for this one. But <laughs> I should have put mine on. <laughs> or so I put, your, put yours on, yeah, regardless. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it says that a Purim is instead celebrated on the 15th of the month. Uh, I'm sorry, let me start over. In cities that were protected by a surrounding wall at, at the time, uh, Purim is instead celebrated on the 15th month on what is known as, 15th of the month, in what is known as Shushan Purim. Since fighting in the walled city of Shushan mm -hmm. continued one extra day wow. at the time of this whole thing with, with Esther. So there you go. So today, only Jerusalem and a few other cities celebrate Purim on the 15th. How well, there you that? go. Yeah. There you go. That explains that. Yeah. So. And I, I, let me just say, too, yeah, that it, for people that aren't familiar with the calendar or with TCG. Mm -hmm. uh, Chronological Gospels. Chronological Gospels Bible. All the events that are in here are on the on the calendar. So you can just kind of, uh, you know, put it all together. Yep. It's just right there for you. There's a great trifecta of information for- It really uh, is. Like when you, when you have a Bible study and you really wanna go into like, okay, what's Michael talking about? Was it really 70 weeks? And how do we really get to understand that this was the truth? You combine that Bible with the calendar and Michael's 70 week chart 
and everything lines up. Everything it lines up. A, it's beautiful. It really is, you know. And and you can actually get these items for free. Oh, really, Angie? Oh, Tell us how oh, to really, do that. You can. So we're doing a campaign okay. to get more ambassadors to come on board. Okay, now, first um, of all, who's an ambassador? What's an ambassador? An ambassador is, they are fully committed to support this ministry to help us get this message out. They don't expect anything in return. They are boots on the ground, uh, just... They're like us. Our our goal, and I tell them this, our goal for 24 is souls. That is the bottom line, is to get the message out, get the word out, get truth out, and bring the harvest in. So we're doing a campaign. It's um, it's for one-time donation um, for the year, $1,200. Right, because an Ambassador Club membership is like a, a commitment of at least 100 a at month. At least 100 so. a month, or you can pay it annually. Or you can donate. Let me say, donate an, uh, annually. So what we're what we're giving? We're giving away TCG Second Edition, mm. uh, the new calendar, right? And this amazing bag. Plus there'll be other incentives. But this has your logo on it. You know, the little flight pattern. The Ambassador and, Club. The we're taking it to the world, and so that's why there's the wings on there. Right. So. It, it, Exactly, and then it's got some little inserts that go with it, you know, some great little bags, little travel bags. You know, speaking of which, so that bigger one, you'd mentioned something interesting about that one. Mm -hmm. So it's not just for Bible stuff and like books and things. There's a, a net in there, which if you went to the beach and you had like wet, you know, wet stuff, you could put it in there. Yeah. And you could literally put it with your Bible and nothing else would get wet because it's a separate zippered thing. Yeah, yeah. Great. You could put your laptop in there, whatever. Whatever you want yeah. to use it for. Very Food, practical. whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's perfect for a Shabbat uh, when you go to your Torah gathering or yes. if you go to the beach. Yes. <laughs> Whatever. And I love the fact, too, that it is a conversation starter. Yes. People are like, what is that? You know, are you a flight attendant? All right. An ambassador you know, of what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So That's great. And the ambassador, I really appreciate the ambassador club just personally because they are, you know, pe people come and go and that kind of thing, and that's okay. They get what they need from a rude awakening, they move on. But right. the ambassador club members, like you said, are truly, they're dedicated. dedicated. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there, there's people that's been with Michael since, you know, way before this even started. Yep. So, yeah, they're very committed, very committed to this ministry. And really, they are this ministry safety net. Yes. We don't have a safety net of some, you know, corporation that's out there the waiting truth. in the wings in case things go wrong and they're going to donate a million dollars. That that's, is the that truth. That doesn't exist. There's not, it's not out there. That is the truth. It, this is only supported by those who appreciate Michael's teachings and those uh, folks that we bring up on the stage here. So that's why we try to be real careful about who we bring up here. I think Bear is an excellent... Uh, representative. You know, he's he's rough around the edges, but listen I to the guy. I love that. I love that. Yeah, but listen to the guy. He's He knows his Torah. Yes, he does. He's yes, a, he does. I'm excited about this series. Yep. I think it's a good follow-up from where Jake yep. uh, taught to, and then going to Bear. And we've had that one uh, Revelation preparation series we did about a year ago or so. This builds on that. Bear was not a part of that. And we've been uh, since introduced to Bear, and he is the king of preparedness. I tell you what. Yes. And he's he is a 100% sold out Torah believer as mm -hmm. well uh, in Yeshua. Yes. So yes, very interesting, very in and with some great insight. Yeah, he's a perfect guy to have on this, yeah. this kind of thing. And in fact, we want you to see a little bit of that before we start. So here is a little bit of what you're going to see from Bear Independent tonight. Uh, there's a there's a Christian belief, a pushback, an argument of, in a nutshell, Jesus will take care of me. My God would never do that to me. That really frustrates me because if you've read the Bible, the Father does not keep his people from disaster. He stewards them through it. Very big difference. All right, there you have it. Trauma, tactics, and Torah. <laughs> Bear Independent shares the do's and don'ts. The triple what, T's. The triple T's <laughs> of what you need for this life and more importantly, what you need for the next life, for eternity. And right now, it's time to prepare for the Kiddush. So get your bread and wine and we'll meet you back here with Michael in two minutes. The same threat that Israel faces is coming soon to America. In a hard hitting message that got him banned from Christian television, Avi Lipkin delivers the truth about what's going on. The information has to be gotten out to all of you in America because uh, you, you just don't get the information in your media. I think your media people in the States don't even know these things. Only select, uh, you know, media people like you know and Michael Rue know these things. 
Israel from the Inside with Avi Lipkin explains Israel's war with its neighbors, civil war brewing within its own borders, new threats of terror tunnels under Jewish towns, and political backstabbing inside the Knesset. This teaching is not available anywhere online, but we'll give it to you as our thanks for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 as a love gift to this ministry in February, we'll give you Israel from the Inside with Avi Lipkin on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll give you Israel from the Inside, plus a decorative blue and gold mezuzah made of pewter featuring an image of the menorah. Donate $300 and we'll give you Israel from the Inside, the pewter mezuzah, and a complete Torah scroll in Hebrew protected in a cylindrical leather-like case. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Root to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. Your donations ensure that urgent teachings like Israel from the Inside with Avi Lipkin keep coming from A Rude Awakening International. Use your smartphone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts or call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. When Yeshua fed the 5,000 with leavened barley loaves in the Galilee, the Pharisees came down on him because they accused him that he and his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate bread. They did not wash their hands with a negel vesser and say this prayer, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us concerning the washing of hands. Why didn't Yeshua do that? Why didn't his disciples follow that? Because it is takanot. It is a law which they invented, and Moses said no one is ever allowed to add to or subtract from. But the night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took bread, and he put in place a rehearsal that was really put in place by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek himself brought forth bread and wine to Abraham, and Yeshua interpreted that very thing. Baruch kata Yehovah Elohinu melech ha'olam, hamotzi lechem miharetz. This is what Yeshua put in place, that before we eat bread, that we say this prayer, and as often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of him, because his broken body was broken for us, and by his stripes we were healed. So as often as we do this, as often we do it in remembrance of him. And Yeshua took the cup, and he said, Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech Beret pre hagafen. The creator of the fruit of the vine, Yehovah, created the fruit of the vine. He said, This represents the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this. Remember me. And remember, I will be drinking this with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Shabbat Shalom. Well, last week we learned that maybe ammo wasn't the first thing you needed to be prepared. Maybe it was a medical kit in your back pocket. Well, wait, that's not the first thing. What about water? Well, yeah. What about food? Well, yeah, yeah, we need that too. We'll get to that. What about communications? Yeah, we need that. But there's something even more important than that. Please welcome from Bear Independent, Bear from the Internet, TJ Morris. Welcome Shalom. back. Shalom. Shalom. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. So what is the first thing we need if it's not all that? What is the eternal disposition of your soul? Mm. Where are you going? Who do you serve? Um, I think there's a lot of, so preparedness is incredibly important. I've built a brand around preparedness, but it, within that brand of preparedness, we've also read 
every word of the New Testament on camera and every word from Genesis chapter one through Ezekiel 35 thus far on camera, and we're working all the way through, right? And so it's, you know, it's prophesied that there will be famine in end times. Yeah, there will, there will also be a famine of the word, mm. right? Yeah. So do you have the word? Do you have the word made flesh? Are you covered by the blood of the son? Has there been atonement that's been made for your sins and your lawlessness so that you can enter back into the household of the most high Yah? Are you conducting yourself as a man of Elohim or a woman of Elohim or are you a heathen, right? So getting that stuff squared away first, good to go. Because now, working definition of preparedness, perpetuating normalcy for the people that we love, now that I've dealt with the spiritual plane, I can focus on the physical plane, right? And I'm in union with Yah's will, being guided by the Ruach HaKodesh rather than just wandering in the wilderness over here by myself. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about preparedness at the channel, bear independent, and a lot of people, uh, there's, a, there's a Christian belief, uh, a pushback, an argument of, in a nutshell, Jesus will take care of me. My God would never do that to me. That really frustrates me because if you've read the Bible, the Father does not keep his people from disaster, he stewards them through it. Very big difference. Right, there's <laughs> how many times you gotta read through here and see the destruction of Jerusalem, right? And um, I mean, even the wicked and adulterous generation that wandered the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years so they could die off, he still gave them bread, mm -hmm. right? Yep. It's like, I'm really pissed at you guys. Also, here's bread, you know? And so from a, a biblical standpoint, um, the father doesn't, you know, rapture theory and all of this and avoidance and replacement theology, put all that over here. A, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, right? We talked about that previously. If I can tell, the word, you know, the word famine is used in the Bible 87 times. Probably, the Father probably wants us to key in on, hey, this can be a thing, right? Messiah prophesies in Matthew chapter 24, Famine is one of the things. There'll be wars and rumors of wars and famine and plague and disease and earthquakes in diverse places, and then they shall deliver you up and kill you, right? And these are the beginning of the birth pains. Now, we're just getting started when all this stuff happens. So we need food storage. We need water storage. Um, a lot of people tend to focus on firearms from a preparedness standpoint. It, it's, um, to most people, it's a logical starting point because firearms solve immediate problems immediately. I would much prefer you're so well prepared that you never have to fire a shot. Because hmm. if we get into it, if your strategy is I'm going to get into and win as many gunfights as possible in SHTF or end times, you're gonna lose. The best units on planet Earth have a rate of attrition. And newsflash, we're not soldiers. Neither are the people you're doing life with. Your congregation, not soldiers. I'm not trading my brother's life for this mission to be successfully completed. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of application of military concepts to preparedness that doesn't work because we're not the military. We're not soldiers. You don't have Uncle Sam's supply chain and logistics. We got to buy our stuff. Nobody's buying it for us, right? So rather than getting into as many gunfights as we can, that you should have the ability to defend yourself. And I would go as far as to say to preemptively defend yourself. For example, what we're seeing happening in Israel. Um, but it's not the be all end all. You should have firearms, you should have ammunition, you should have magazines, you should train with them, you should know how to use them and not just standing still on a flat range statically, but shoot, move, communicate, sustain, the most important of which is move. Don't stand here and shoot because it's just a matter of time before all those bullets that you're sending that way cause bullets to come back this way. Right, so get off the X, as you said. That's exactly right, get off the X, which goes into medical. A lot of people don't prep medical um, because they don't know about it or they, they're, they don't know enough about it to be comfortable with it. There's not a lot of resources where you can go and get tactical medical training. Um, but if you stocked 10,000 rounds of 5.56 and you expect to shoot 10,000 rounds of 5.56, how many rounds do you think are coming back at you? And what's the, the rate of incidence that one of those rounds finds this flesh, 
that we have. Right, because if you're going to get ambushed at your house or your farm, mm -hmm. there's going to be more than one guy. Mm -hmm. And you're one guy, but they've got five guys. Mm -hmm. And if I shoot you in the femur and I hit your femoral artery, you've got about 90 seconds before you bleed out. About 90 seconds. And there's lots of different ways that we can deal with that. Uh, the first is a committee on TCCC recommended windless tourniquet. I'll unpack that for you. A tourniquet is the, well, I've got one, right? Picture says a thousand words. Do you yep. mind? Go ahead, okay. please. That's great you have one. I didn't know you did. Of course did. I <laughs> Bro, of course I have one. This is a soft tee from TACMED. Um, we sell this and one other type of tourniquet at refugemedical.com. And basically the way this works is that this is a constricting band. We're going to put this high and tight, either on the arm or the leg. Well, I'll show you. Okay, so you just pull it in like this. Mm -hmm. This is called the windlass. I want to keep the windlass in my workspace. I don't want it back here where I can't get to it. I don't want it under here. I want it right here. And when I turn this rod, what happens is it constricts that band, and then I tuck it in there. And as it constricts that band, it's constricting the musculature against the artery and it's pinching the artery in between the musculature and the bone. So it pinches off the bleeding vessel. Now I don't have arterial blood flow to this arm anymore. There's a lot of bad doctrine out there on tourniquets. Uh, it used to be taught life over limb, that you only apply a tourniquet to save a life, but if you do, that person will lose the limb. 75th Ranger Regiment has done myriad studies over 20 years of the global war on terror, and as have many others, and what they've found is that not a single person, not one person, lost a limb because of a tourniquet. Hmm. They lost limbs because of the injury that they sustained that required the tourniquet in the first place, but not because of the tourniquet. And if you think about it, your vital organs um, require constant blood flow. Your kidneys, your lungs, your liver. That's why when somebody goes into shock, all the blood is pulled from their extremities into the core of their body so the vital organs can maintain blood flow. Your brain, not a vital organ, just flesh. If you go in for knee surgery, you know what they're gonna do? Put a tourniquet on your leg so you don't bleed all over the table. And then when they're done, they take it off. So the longest incidence of having a tourniquet on a battle time casualty was 18 hours from Afghanistan to Germany. And guy was fine. Hmm. So you wanna have a tourniquet for uh, arterial bleeds in the extremities. And I know something interesting there. You're doing all this with one hand. Yeah. That's an important thing to remember. Absolutely. Uh, so for the lives that have been saved with refuge kits, somebody was missing their hand or lower arm. And so we build all of our kits where they, the kit can be deployed, accessed, and utilized with one hand. Very important. Mm. Um, but anyway, you want to have... A committee on TCCC recommended tourniquet. The committee on TCCC is the Committee for Tactical Combat Casualty Care. They are the people that have studied, again, uh, more than 25,000 battlefield injuries and offer, um, offer recommendations on what you should use and what you shouldn't use. There are a lot of people that will say, well, this is a $30 tourniquet. I can get one for five bucks on Amazon. You can, from China, that will break. I break them on camera all the time. How much is your life worth, Scott? More than 30 bucks. More than oh, yeah. 30 bucks? <laughs> Let me ask you another question. How much does it cost to buy flowers for a funeral? Mm. Again, more than 30 bucks. More than 30 bucks. I'd rather spend 30 bucks on a tool that I know is going to work than spend $5 on something that is guaranteed to kill me and also gives me a false sense of confidence. And so, Tactical medical preps, is, it's one of the things that we do. It's one of the things that we teach at the channel. If you can't come to class, which you should, refugetraining.com, but if you can't come to class at the Bear Independent channel, I have an entire playlist, the trauma medicine playlist. It's four hours long. It covers everything for free, everything that we teach in our level one class hmm. at Refuge Training. And so you can, you can get a kit from us or anybody else, lay it out on the table and go through it and utilize how to apply a tourniquet, arm and leg, how to pack a wound, why do I need a chest seal, what's the pleural space, how does it work? Pleural space is in between right here, the crook of your neck and your belly button. It's where your lungs are. Your lungs operate in a vacuum. So every time you inhale, the diaphragm pulls down, which causes the lungs to expand. If I poke a hole in your chest, 
When the diaphragm pulls down, that air goes in through the hole instead of through your windpipe, and now you can't breathe. Mm. So how do I reestablish a vacuum in the pleural space? I apply a sticky piece of plastic called the chest seal to that hole, and now when the diaphragm pulls down, we're operating in a vacuum again. So it's very basic stuff, but it's something that a lot of people miss because guns are sexy. Right? I've got a Daniel Defense Mark IV with my, I don't care. And a lot of people talk about an idol. A lot of people idolize their weapons. It's got this thing and that thing. Can you shoot it? Have you trained with it? Yeah. Can you hit a 10 inch circle at 300 meters with it? Dare I say a lot of believers mm -hmm. make their weapons an idol. 100%. Well, you, you'll see that, man. There's a lot of people that will um, laser engrave or CNC verses and stuff onto their guns. Dude, it's a tool. It's, it, my weapon matters no more to me than the hammer that I picked today to go frame up a barn. It's a tool. And I think that people should be students of weapons craft, not idolize the weapons that they have. I should be able to set an AK or a pump shotgun or an FNFAL or a AR-15 or a Glock or a Smith & Wesson revolver, anything in front of you, and you're like, yep, got it. So that's training, right? But from a preparedness standpoint, a lot of people focus on, we're gonna have a fight, it's gonna be a big fight, and I gotta win the big fight. Right, and you're gonna probably get hit. It's not yeah. like the movies. Yeah, it's stupid. Why do I wanna have a big fight? My job is to perpetuate normalcy for the people that I love. My wife and kids are over here. I don't know if you know this, but modern American houses don't stop bullets at all. Five, five, six, 62 grain will zip right through the one side of your house and out the other and just keep going. This is not the place to have a fight. I don't wanna have a fight at all. You push me into a corner, it's a bad day for you, but I don't wanna have a fight at all. And so a big part of that as well from a preparedness standpoint is, you could call it a map recon. We call it an area study. Pull up Google Maps, find your house. Zoom out just a little bit. What are the nine houses around you? Who are they, what do they do? The internet's crazy, what people can do with OSINT tools, open source intelligence tools today. Um, do you know those nine people in your neighborhood that live around you? The answer for most people is no. But it'd be really good to know those nine people because whether you like it or not, if things go sideways, that's your team. Hmm. If you don't already have a team, if you're not part of a fellowship or a congregation or an assembly, that's your team. Uh, and then zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. And most people tend to go too big. They're, they're, well, over here in Cincinnati, there's an ammo depot. I don't care. I'm not anywhere near Cincinnati, right? So having a map recon and then looking at what are the most likely things that are going to affect me? Most likely. It's not the zombies, the zombie hordes. Where are they? I haven't seen zombies yet. The whole internet has talked about when SHCF happens, the zombie horde, where are they? I haven't seen them. It's not the Hamas sleeper cells, being perfectly honest. Uh, you're gonna starve to death if you don't store, store food. And we can read in the word in end times, they're not gonna let us buy food unless we take a certain mark, which again, if you take preparedness to its, uh, down a long enough timeline, you end up on a farm or a homestead. Oh, did you see they put mRNA vaccinations in the meat? Not in my cattle, they didn't. Not in my sheep, they didn't. Definitely not in my turkeys, they're ornery. You can't even get near them, right? So you, you go down a far enough timeline, it, it becomes self-reliance in unity with Yah's will for the preservation of life. What's the Torah about? The preservation of life. Matthew 19, 17, if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. Roger that, thank you. I was unclear on that, but I got it now, right? So the Torah is about the preservation of life. Preparedness should be about the preservation of life, not just getting into one big gunfight or 100 big gunfights, that's stupid. Because it doesn't matter how good you are, there is a rate of attrition and you cannot replace your brothers and sisters whom you are your brother's keeper Yah gave you them for stewardship and for reproof and instruction, and you're gonna go spend them on this stupid operation to go break into grandpa's house and take his moldy graham crackers? That's stupid.
right? So firearms, food, medical. Sorry, I'm dominating the no, conversation. No, that's okay. Go well, ahead, I was, brother. I was gonna say, but it's just like Yeshua, where Yeshua didn't go out looking for fights. If people surrounded him, we have proof in the word that he backed out and disappeared. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he had, um, his mission wasn't complete yet. Mm -hmm. Just like you were saying, your mission is to protect your family, not to go out guns blazing. Yep. You're dead on the floor. Now your kids and your wife are taken hostage, or mm -hmm. God forbid, what else? Yep. It's that, you know, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. But I think a lot of people, especially in the preparedness space, there's not a, there's not a myriad of good sources of information on how as a believer, as a follower of Messiah, and a keeper of the commands, you know, Revelation 14, 12, here is the endurance of the saints, those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keep the commands. Cool, I think they're talking about us. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to endure, what should we do? Have a testimony of Yeshua, and not just with your mouth, not the Greek logos assent, I believe. No, you are what you do, James. Right. Show you my belief by my works, and keep the commands. Which commands? Matthew 19, 17, if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands, right? And, okay, but how do we prepare? Biblically, how do we prepare? How do we preserve life? How do we perpetuate normalcy for the people that we love? If they're not gonna let us buy and sell in end times, and I'm not saying we're in end times, but man, it feels like we're knocking on the door of end times. Um, well, I should probably have the things that I need. Food, sanitation. Mm -hmm. People miss sanitation all the time. The, uh, what would you suggest for sanitation, just by the way? Okay, so historically. More than just toilet paper. Yes, <laughs> although, you know, I bet you there's a bunch of people since 2020 have way too much toilet paper now <laughs> that they spent a dollar a roll on. But um, historically in warfare, the enemy only accounts for one third of our casualties. The other two thirds are logistics and disease. Mm. Well, I'm in charge of logistics and disease. I can't control the enemy, but these other two thirds, that's me. I'm in charge of that. So sanitation, really basic stuff. First of all, don't prep a gallon of water per person per day. Prep three gallons of water per person per day because you need a minimum of one to drink, one to prepare all your long-term food that you bought, which a lot of people miss, your freeze-dried food and all that parboiled food, you need water to cook that. And then you need one for sanitation. Uh, washing your hands after you use the bathroom, before you touch food. Flies, fingers, feces, that's how people get sick. Flies, fingers, feces, learn that from my brother Saw. What's up, Saw? <laughs> Former Green Beret brother uh, is awesome. Now people say might say just about the water. Mm -hmm. Okay, I live in a neighborhood. I don't have a homestead yet. Mm -hmm. How can I store that much water? And how much do I should I be storing? And where the heck do I do that in my yard? Gutter, downspout, rain barrel, fifty gallon plastic drums in your garage. So even if it gets below freezing, it's above freezing ambient in your garage, plus you have the volume of water. IBC totes, you know, two hundred seventy five to three hundred thirty gallons. Um, it, it's totally doable. And, I, then you, and then you need to have a, uh, something to, to uh, uh, make that water drinkable, make yeah. it potable. Yep, uh, Berkey filter, um, aqua tabs, uh, Sawyer mini water filtration. There's a lot of options out there. Um, I like filtration uh, more than I like treatment. And we should talk about urban homesteading and suburban homesteading in preparedness, because there's a lot of people going, cool, cool story, Barry, you live out in the woods I don't live out in the woods. Yeah, well, I homesteaded on a third of an acre in North Texas, mm. so. Okay, well, let's get into that next. That's a good point. Let's yep. go there. Okay, so you're watching Bear Independent, better known as TJ Morris on Shabbat Night Live. Thank you for bringing him here. I'm learning a lot. Hopefully you are too. Thanks, you did it with your donations. Donations in the past led to this program today, and your donations today lead to other people watching this into the future, and they're gonna need this, so thank you in advance.
hey, thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. Before the break, we were talking about, well, hey, I don't have a homestead yet. I've got a yard in a neighborhood. How the heck am I supposed to homestead there? Good question. Well, it turns out you could totally do it. Um, my wife and I lived on a third of an acre in North Texas uh, where the soil is not conducive to gardening. And three bedroom, two bath house, um, not a great house, not a great yard, nice neighborhood. Food production, water storage, um, two primary things you need to be concerned about. Again, everybody focuses on security, defending what you have, but you need to shift your mindset from consumer to producer, okay? Don't just consume calories. Don't just spend money. How do I produce calories? And so we had in our backyard, we had 11 raised beds. We had an area of row crops that we just dug up the soil. I had 14 foot tall uh, sunflowers, a nine foot tall corn growing in my backyard. Six foot privacy fence, nine foot corn, 14 foot sunflowers. <laughs> I mean, it was a beacon, like, hey, we got food over here, you know? Yeah. Um, and then we had mature, um, uh, mature nut trees, and we had berry bushes, and we had uh, fruit trees all in the backyard. Prior to Torah, we had uh, meat rabbits and a meat rabbit hutch. Now, if, and if you're keeping Torah, it's dog food, right? So that's something to consider. We had meat birds. We had 10 meat birds on pasture, which was our backyard, and a little tiny chicken tractor mm. that we'd walk out and move every day, or the kids would, and kids, chores and kids are good. And give children responsibility, uh, otherwise they will grow up into adulthood and you'll have a sloth who can't yeah. do anything. Um, so first of all, move to a neighborhood that doesn't have an HOA that does not allow you to have chickens. Yeah, HOA is not great. Um, although I do, and this is, I'm not making this up, I know one person that got their dairy goat uh, listed as a um, like support, a support goat. Yeah, a support goat. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yep. And I know another person <laughs> that got their flock of six chickens uh, listed as support chickens. For so, mental health. Uh, yeah, for mental, for mental health. health. Yeah, um, that's great. So, and roosters, <laughs> if you don't know, roosters are incredibly obnoxious. Uh, if there's anybody from my channel watching now, they're laughing because on multiple occasions, I have shot roosters in the middle of a video or live stream. <laughs> we have so many roosters, I'm just like, I can't focus. And I'm like, hey, okay, hold on. <laughs> All right, so anyway, what I was trying to say was, dude, on Pesach, I'm reading Matthew chapter five, and I'm trying to record Matthew chapter five, right? And Pesach's coming up, and this one guinea hen, we had a guinea hen, one left, and it comes running from 150 yards away. Have you ever seen a guinea hen? Yes. Oh, dude, they're the worst. They're delicious, <laughs> but they're so annoying. Comes running up, and it stands on a hay bale, Right where Dudley's at, 10 yards away. And I'm like, okay, hold on. 45 hollow point, boom. And it goes, <laughs> and just falls over, reholster. And I'm thinking this is going to ruin Matthew chapter 5, right? And of course, we're getting into Matthew 5, 17. I come not to destroy the Torah or the prophets, but to complete, play ra'u, embody, for truly, truly, I say unto you, until heaven and earth passes away, which are still here, by the way, not one word shall fall from the Torah till all be done. Well, because I shot that stupid guinea hen in the middle of the video, it got like 10 times the views that it would have <laughs> normally gotten. So like y'all used this annoying guinea hen to, to help spread the word, right? Uh, in spite of how broken I am that I shoot animals on camera. <laughs> so don't get a rooster, right? Unless you live out in the country, they're very annoying. Uh, but you can absolutely get laying hens, you can get meat birds, you can produce food in your backyard. And in North Texas, we were producing 40% of our household food part-time. We spent a half an hour per day and two hours on Sunday, tending the garden, working the animals, all of that. We had rainwater catchment coming off the backside of the house, uh, piped into 55 gallon food grade drums. Uh, we had firewood in the backyard, so we had a way to heat, a way to cook, we had food to eat, and this is just part-time in the suburbs. It will require a mental shift for you, like I said, from consumer to producer, but it's so good for your children to see, hey, this is where food comes from. This is what a potato looks like. It doesn't have to be you know, cut into fries inside of a red cardboard thing, like this is a potato. This is meat, 
And for them to see when we process meat, the finality of that, when I take a knife and I draw it across this thing's neck, it doesn't scream, it doesn't talk back to you like in a Disney movie, it doesn't any of that, it's just, and when you process kosher, process Leviticus 11, it immediately loses blood pressure to its brain, it blacks out immediately, and then the heart pushes all of the blood out of the body. Cool. And so it's clean meat that's prepared cleanly with no mRNA vaccines or 40 chlorine baths or anything, it's just meat. And as your children see that and they start to realize, A, something had to die so you could live. What an interesting concept biblically. Something had to die so you could live, but also this is really good for you. This is real food. The nutrient density in this food far exceeds anything I can go to the store and buy. And so you can do that on a third of an acre or less. I know many people that are doing it on 0.18 acres, you know, 0.2 acres all around the country. The people, we call them the Bear Nation at our channel who write in are saying, hey, Bear, we, we did it, we're doing it. Producing up to 50% of their food part-time on their suburban homesteads. Mm. And so it's really, it's a, it's a mindset shift more than it is, you're gonna spend, it, you're not saving money when you're doing this, by the way, but you're deferring costs. Instead of spending it at the grocery store or Walmart or wherever you're shopping, you're now spending it on soil for your raised beds, on your laying hens. And, but it, in return, okay, when I harvest these peppers, I core it and I've got these seeds, and I seed save these peppers. If I do my job right, I never, never have to buy pepper seeds again. And after three or four generations, I have a pepper that is perfectly in tune with its environment. Our days of sunshine, the amount of rainfall that we get, the humidity, the soil, mycorrhizae, the minerals that are in here, like this pepper knows now, right? These eggs, remember when eggs were like 10 bucks a dozen? I have more eggs than I can handle. <laughs> we give eggs away because my wife has like 40 chickens. Mm. So it can be done. And so it's, it's not about saving money because you're going to invest in this infrastructure. But once you do, you're getting this rich, nutrient-dense food that's much closer to the way Yah intended it to be than what these handful of megacorps have made food to be now. And it's resilient. If they don't let you buy and sell, cool, there's, there's food in my backyard. And then you learn how to pressure can and water bath can and dehydrate and maybe freeze dry and you're taking the excess, you can set that aside to forsake not the widow and the orphan. You see somebody in distress, there's a donkey in a ditch, I can help you. We've given away more food than I can count hmm. because of the abundance of the blessing. It's almost like y'all meant it when he told Isaac, like, hey man, I will bless your seed tenfold, thirtyfold, a hundredfold. It's like, what are you doing? What do you do with all this food? You know, we have days where it's like, if I eat one more cucumber, I'm gonna jump off of a tall building because we've got 87 <laughs> pounds of cucumbers, you know? And so it, it can be done. It's just a, it's a mindset shift. And we need to take preparedness out of, out of the, uh, the column of it's a defensive strategy for when the zombie apocalypse happens and move it into an offensive strategy for the preservation of life. Mm. So yes, get your buckets of freeze-dried food and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, stop. Mm -hmm. Now invest in how to grow more and like you said, produce more mm -hmm. on your land so it's not just saving. Well, it's the same strategy with uh, saving for retirement. Mm -hmm. Have income-producing assets. Yep. That's your primary, and the savings is the backup, Yep. right? So Deuteronomy 28 talks about, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, then you will be blessed. One of those blessings is on your storehouses. Implied task, have storehouses. Tracking, right? Mm -hmm. How did Joseph steward the father's chosen people through seven years of famine? They had storehouses, right? And so I think that people should have, uh, the way I like to explain this is you should have your working pantry and depending on the size of your family and the size of your house and the size of your income, this can be one month to three months of just stuff that we eat all the time that's just in the pantry. And you never have to worry about it going bad because we're constantly rotating through it. Then you should have a long-term food storage of stuff that's shelf stable, which generally, if it comes out of a grocery store, if it's in a box, in a jar, or in a can, it'll last a year. 
It may last longer than that, but it'll last at least a year. And you should have about a year's worth of stuff for that, if you can. And then the four kinds, corn, rice, wheat, and beans. We put these in Mylar bags with oxygen absorbers. We put them in buckets. We bang a lid on with an O-ring. They will last literally forever. They are still finding grain from Joseph in the pyramids, wheat, mm -hmm. and it's good to go. It'll, in the right climate, the right temperature, away from uh, sunlight, moisture, rodents and insects, it will literally last forever, almost like Yah's got a plan. Because at some point, I really do believe they are not, they are not gonna let us buy and sell anymore. They're gonna starve us out. It's one of the oldest tactics in the book, right? You lay siege to a city. I don't wanna fight you, I'll just starve you out. Yeah, but surround the, them and don't let supplies come in. I got all the food I need over here. Uh, I mean, there's stories of that in the Bible, mm -hmm. right? And atrocities that have occurred. Hey, King, can I talk to you? Because uh, me and this woman, we had a deal and yesterday we ate my son because there was no food. And today we were gonna eat her son, but she's hidden her son from me. So can you come and do right ruling on this because I'm hungry and I wanna go eat her kid. And then the king tears his garment, sackcloth and ashes and cries out to Yah, how do we get to this point? Cause you were disobedient. Sorry, I apologize. No, uh, good point. So that has happened before to the father's chosen people, right? So we need to not, Overlook that. My God would never do that to me. I like to tell people, your God's make-believe. My God's real. My God is God, and he has done that because I read about it in this book. So the four types of food, uh, food storage, long-term grains, corn, right, wheat, be wheat, and beans, water for food preparation, defensive stuff, absolutely. Um, medicines, if you're on any type of long-term medication, uh, go to your doctor and just have a very simple conversation. I'm concerned about how crazy the world's looking. I'd like to get a 90 day supply. I'd like to get a 360 day supply. And I know for a lot of people, funding is an issue there. Maybe you can crowdfund that with your assembly or your congregation. That's a good option, yeah. Um, you know, there's there are other options. There's like good RX coupon codes and all that. But get as much of that back stock of stuff as you can that if slash when, for whatever reason, whether Yah's fixing to call us all home or China felt froggy or Russia's got another wild hair up there, you know, whatever, supply chain disruption's a thing. I don't want good people to die. That's the whole point of preparedness for me is preservation of life. Just like the Torah is about preservation of life for us. And so they're just, it's very foundational, biblical stuff like, Y'all will bless your storehouses. Well, then you ought to have storehouses. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely it does. Wow. So now there's a few things that we need to uh, remember here. Is, uh, com, com, uh, coms, mm -hmm. or como as you mm -hmm. like to call it. Uh, so where do we go with that? So we've got, we've got everything else. We've got the food planned, all this kind of stuff. But like you said, uh, you know, armies go down mm -hmm. because they didn't communicate. Yep. So how do we keep that up and running? Okay, so logistics are driven by communications. So commo is vitally important. Too many people, especially in the ham radio community, focus outward. I need to be able to talk outward. Um, not primarily you don't. Every time you key that radio microphone, depending on who the enemy is, um, you are emitting a signal that can be triangulated. You can be located about that fast. Even with ham. Oh, 100% with ham. Uh, HF is harder to do for technical reasons that I won't get into right now. But suffice it to say that myself and several other brothers through our training organization, Refuge Training, we do op for, opposition force for um, some of the best military units on planet Earth. Mm. There have been multiple occasions where I have keyed my radio to talk to my guys, intra-squad communications, simplex from one radio to another radio, not touching a repeater, not, not out into the world, just from one radio to another. And the long antenna bros, the Air Force, uh, you ever see a guy wearing a plate carrier with three radios where his mag should be? Avoid that guy at all costs because he will call in aerial assets you didn't know existed and you're gone. I have been smoked a hundred times from pressing my radio transmit button in the wrong environment. So that's something to consider, who's the enemy? And I, I pray that we never find ourselves in a situation where we have to fight the United States military. 
And I'm not saying that we're in a position where we will, but gosh dang, man, they're really good at what they do. Um, so intra-squad communication in a permissive environment where I can transmit on the radio, I would need to be able to talk to the other people in my group, my MAG, mutual assistance group, or my congregation, my assembly, my neighbors, neighborhood watch. You can pick an innocuous name for it. We're the neighborhood watch or the community outreach group or whatever. Cool. If I need you to take this truck and go over here, but I can't see you, how do I communicate with you? I can key this microphone, key this radio and say, hey, Scott, what's up, man? Uh, come get with me. But I probably don't want to use your name. That's a thing. Um, very secure. I can send a runner. Little kids are great for this. Here's a little slip of paper. Or go tell Brother Scott to come see me. All right? They're really good for that. Uh, and that maintains a lot of operational security as well because every time you key that radio, people can listen. I, I don't care how good your radio is. Now, the flip side of that is you should have radios. Um, the Baofangs are wildly popular. They shouldn't be because they're Chinese garbage. They fall apart. Um, we use, uh, for Simplex, we use the Yesu FT-65. And it does everything that the Baofang does but it's a way more ruggedized, militarized radio. It's just 10 times stronger than the Baofeng is. So people say, Yesu, how do you spell that? Y-A-E-S-U. Thank you, okay. You're welcome. Um, so it's a good radio, it works for Simplex. And that's for intra-squad communications. We wanna be able to talk to everybody within a few miles of here. You can also use Camo to passively, passively monitor what's happening out there in the world. Whether it's uh, ham repeaters, weather stations, uh, local law enforcement, and a lot of jurisdictions, um, law enforcement is not running Motorola VTAC radios because they're very expensive. So as you get further out into the uh, less populated areas, more and more likely that law enforcement, EMS, and fire are going to be running uh, open UHF or VHF radios, and you can hear them. Very useful, especially in an emergency situation, to know what the county sheriffs are dealing with or what EMS is dealing with, or what search and rescue is dealing with. You can key all that in, and I'm not the combo expert, I have people for that, but you can key all that into your radio and just flip to the search and rescue frequency and hear what those guys are doing over there. Or I really like monitoring the sheriffs because in a rural area, they are who is interfacing with all these people. So what, if they have a really busy day, that's an indicator. Uh, but combo is important. It's important so that we can, um, facilitate logistics, and logistics wins wars. That's how I make sure you have the food, water, ammunition, shelter, medicine that you need to have so that you can stay in the fight. And what is the fight? Perpetuating normalcy for the people that we love. Mm. And so, uh, and I'll also say this, because a lot of people when it comes to Camo focus on equipment, and they shouldn't. I think people need to focus on being able to have an actual conversation with one another before we introduce failure points of equipment. A lot of people are incapable of talking to one another and we are given to each other as a body, as an assembly for reproof and instruction. And if you don't love me enough and if your balls aren't big enough to come and talk to me now face to face, I don't care what kind of radio you have. It doesn't matter. And so I think Many of us need a revival in that area of our life, of being able to go speak truth and love to people that we love. We have a phrase in our assembly called, I love you, but, and it's uh, usually an indicator that we're about to have a conversation. And praise Yah that we love each other enough that we're willing to have uncomfortable conversations with people because I don't want people to backslide. I don't want people to do harm to themselves. Right? And because I love you, not because of my ego, not because I wanna be right, because I love you, I'm willing to hurt myself enough to go through this with you. And so I'm bringing this to your attention because I don't want you to have bad fruit in this area. Mm. I don't want you to give the enemy a foothold. And so with Kama, we focus way too much on what kind of radio and antenna and frequency. No, let's just be able to talk. Let's just sit man to man right here and go, hey man, I see this thing in you and I'm concerned about it. Can you explain that to me? And then be able to back that up with the word. Mm. I think that's missing a lot in our assemblies and in our faith. Um, people are murmuring, key indicator of the Israelites. Yeah. Murmuring, 
don't go over here and talk to him about me. Come over here and talk to me about me. Indeed. And I think we got to get way better at that. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so we're going to continue more important topics next week. Yes, sir. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. You're watching Shabbat Night Live with TJ Morris, better known as Bear Independent. There is his information on the bottom of your screen where you can learn a lot more about what we are talking about today. Really, really valuable stuff. Uh, he's one of the favorites in our group, our Torah group, so uh, hopefully he becomes a favorite in your group too. All right, see you next week. Until then, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.